Hello and welcome to this video, where today we are going to be visiting and analyzing the Paul Klee Centrum by Renzo Piano in the Swiss city of Bern. In case you are not familiar with the figure of Paul Klee, he was a multidisciplinary artist born in 1879 who explored his vision of the world not only through paintings and sculptures, but also through music, writing and philosophy. He was way ahead of what was traditionally accepted in his time and was also one of the progressive figures who helped shape the Bauhaus, where he taught between 1920 and 1931. Even though he was born in Switzerland and he also died there, he spent most of his life in Germany, as Switzerland didn't grant him the Swiss nationality during his lifetime. Building a museum dedicated to his work in Switzerland, right next to the cemetery where Klee was buried, is to some extent a way of trying to fix that wrongdoing. The site where the museum sits was donated by Dr. Morris Muller and his wife, and most of the art on display was donated by Klee's daughter, Livia. The architect chosen to design the building was Renzo Piano, who is known for his sensitivity towards the places where he designs. Other architects have very distinctive styles, and you can easily tell their designs apart regardless of where they are or what they are used for. But that isn't the case with Renzo Piano. And the result in this case is a one-of-a-kind building that resembles no other. And that makes perfect sense. Because how could it look like any other building when he took inspiration from the unique landscape that he found and could see from the site, right? The landscape is the foundation of the entire project. Actually, when Renzo Piano first visited the site, he said, Klee doesn't deserve a museum, he deserves a landscape. Once I realized that, I knew I had to work like a farmer and use the soil to create a sculpture. Designing a museum dedicated to a single artist or any other kind of memorial for that matter, it's a delicate thing. On one hand, you could argue that the building should try to step aside and become sort of like a white canvas for the art inside it. But on the other hand, the building needs to make a statement in order to attract visitors and add value to the neighborhood and the city where it's located. Faced with this dilemma, Renzo Piano, who has extensive experience with difficult briefs, didn't hesitate one bit to announce what his approach would be when he said, we're building a home for Klee, but a building is a building, and not a work by Paul Klee. With that statement, he set himself at the same level as Paul Klee, and made it clear that he wasn't aiming for a neutral building. It was as if he was talking to Klee directly and saying, you know what, you were good at your thing, I'm good at mine, let's achieve something great together. The resulting design resembles three hills that naturally emerge from the ground, following a slight curve that matches the one of the highway that limits the site on the west side. The full scale of the building becomes hard to grasp, as it gradually emerges from the fields around it, making it impossible to tell where the building ends and the fields begin. There are two different layers of organization to the program. First, we find the hills themselves. Each of the three hills is unique in both shape and size, and accommodates different uses in their interiors. The North Hill is the largest and is used to practice art and music, as well as to host several workshops. On the lower level, there is a large space for kids to be introduced to art and practice it with their own hands. The North Hill also houses a 400-seat auditorium, which can be used for conferences and presentations, and even for the newly created Paul Klee Orchestra to perform for the public. The Center Hill is a bit smaller in size. 
Here is where the spaces that are more typical of a museum are located. The main gallery on the upper floor holds the permanent collection, while the one on the lower floor is used for temporary exhibitions. Both galleries are equipped with walls that can be moved around the open space to create different layouts. And in the case of the upper gallery, this all happens under the unusual shape of the undulating roof. The South Hill, the third and last, is reserved for more private uses, such as the research center or the administration offices. Now, the second layer of spatial organization lies on top of the first one and runs from west to east. The three hills are connected to one another by an open street. It really wouldn't be fair to call it a corridor, not only because of its size, but also because of all the activities that happen along its way. The street is 150 meters long from end to end, and it is reserved for the more social and loud activities, such as the cafeteria, the box office or the gift shop. This street is also located towards the front of the building, acting as a sort of buffer between the street and the quiet spaces. It sort of gives people the opportunity to slow down and transition from the outdoors to the exhibition, pacing this transition. The center section is reserved for the galleries and other activity areas, while the east end of the building is reserved for a private corridor accessible only to members of the staff. The structure of the building is one of its most unique elements. You could say that the Polkley Centrum is a very honest building, because nothing is hidden. What you see is what it is. The giant undulating beams are both the structure and the ornaments of the design. These steel beams are massive, and their curvature is so strong that it was impossible to bend any of the shelf beams and instead, they had to be manually created from flat sheets of steel, having to weld by hand over 40 kilometers of joints. When faced with this constructive challenge, engineers turned to some of the techniques used to build boats, which as you can see, have a very similar shape and structure before the exterior layer is put on. Light and temperature were two main concerns that the design had to keep in mind. This is the case for any museum, but here in particular, as many of Klee's works are watercolors, which are very sensitive to light. To achieve the thermal and lighting standards required by the museum, Renzo Piano turned to natural techniques as much as he could. As we've seen before, the roof of the building and the fields are one and the same, and Earth is a great insulator. The three glass facades are facing west, which means they get sun afternoon for most parts of the year. These large surfaces of glass are protected by retractable textile curtains placed on the outside of the building, which are automatically operated based on the measurements of different sensors. Finally, there is the ventilation system. The oak floors that cover the building are full of tiny slits everywhere. These openings allow the cold air under the floor to flow into the rooms and make its way up to the ceilings before being expelled to the outside, and so cooling the rooms. And that's it for today. Let us know what you thought about the Paul Klee Centrum in the comments below. And if you have any questions about the building which was not covered in this video, drop us a comment as well and we will do our best to find you the answer that you're looking for. See you in the next video. Bye!